Hello dear students and welcome to the Science Castle first year anniversary celebration. My name is Mona Sergi and I'm the headmistress here at the Science Castle. Today we're celebrating a very special event here at the Rocky Science Facilities in Santa Clara, California. The Science Castle is starting one year of age. Within this year the castle has grown significantly. We have nearly 2,000 registered students who contributed a lot to the castle. Our headmaster, Professor Franciscan, has been diligently working to organize great prizes as rewards for our students. He and Mr. Mack, the director of rocket science, have been setting up this event. Our head boy, John, has been preparing something special as well today. And finally, everything is ready to go. And it's my pleasure now to introduce the headmaster of the science council, Professor Franciscan. Hello, and welcome, students of the science council. <laughs> My name is Rolando Franciscan, and it's a pleasure to talk to you the first time via this web lab, um, live webcam. Um, as Mona mentioned, we created or prepared a number of great prizes for you. Um, as you can see on this table over here, we actually um, organized some prizes from several companies like Arbor Scientific, Tools That Teach, Veneer Software, Technology Design with teachers in mind, and we got a couple of Tickle Me plants from the Tickle Me plant company. But before we move on to our traditional award ceremony, I'd like to introduce a very special guest and friend, Sean McChesney from Rocket Science, who is here <laughs> to perform a number of his science experiments for the first time online. Hi John. Hello everyone. How's it going? Very good. Okay, so before John gets started, just a couple of logistical matters. Um, in case you get disconnected throughout the session, simply go back to sciencecastle.com, give it a couple of seconds until the webcam loads again. Um, if you run very low resolution on your monitor, you might have to scroll down in order to see us. Um, you might just hear us, so scroll down until you can see us wave here. And then underneath the screen, you actually see a chat area. Um, it has a text box and a button next to it. You can type at any time um, a question or a comment in there, push the button, and everyone in the, in the um, chat will see it, including us. Okay, so in regards to questions, I think John is probably the best if they wait until the end of each, each experiment to well, ask you. If I happen to notice one or you point one out, I'll answer it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then probably one last thing in terms of um, caution. Um, the experiments that John is doing, if you decide to do them at home, um, you need adult supervision for it. They do include flames, right? Yep. And so be extremely careful um, when you're doing them at home. All right. Now here, Mr. Mac, enjoy the experiments. Have fun. Well, at Rocket Science, we don't usually wear stuff that catches fire too easy because we do burn a lot of stuff. And we like to be just regular folks because scientists don't need a lab coat and kids are the best scientists of all. So I'm going to just set this over here for right now. Uh, I need to tell you a couple of things because all the experiments we're doing today involve caterpillars. And you need to understand how caterpillars work. So if you have a caterpillar, he's got some body segments, he's got some legs, he's got a head, and maybe some antennas. Okay, he's a caterpillar. And a caterpillar is a lot like something we're going to burn today. Our caterpillars are a little different. They're made out of the letter C's stuck together. And for legs, they have H's and a tail. And the C's are carbon and the H's are hydrogen. Hydrogen burns real good, especially when it's by a carbon. And these caterpillars, we're going to mix them with oxygen. And scientists write oxygen O2. When they burn, they make only two things that are chemicals. They make water, H2O. And they make carbon dioxide, CO2. The third thing they make that isn't a chemical is heat. So whenever you burn something, you get some water 
in the form of steam, you get carbon dioxide, and you get heat. So let's suppose you're burning a birthday candle. Here's a regular old birthday candle. You light it up. There. It takes heat to make it go. And it gives off heat. It burns the wax. The wax is made out of the carbons and hydrogens. And it makes carbon dioxide and water. And that's all it makes if you let it burn completely. So that's pretty much all you need to know from a science point of view. Um, although it would be kind of fun to show you one more thing since Roland is here, unsuspecting. Uh, if you take something like a liquid and turn it into a gas, it expands, which is really good. And if you take a liquid like, oh, say, carbon dioxide, and you let that expand, it should change temperature. I don't know if it's going to be hot or cold. We'll ask Roland to tell us. You notice he's wearing goggles and earmuffs and a hat. That's a good thing. On the count of five. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Pretty cold. <laughs> he's actually got little tiny specks of dry ice on him. That's a hundred degrees below zero. He's still alive. But he's a wizard. He can do that. <laughs> Thanks, Roman. So when something expands, it changes temperature. And we're going to use that a little bit. When air expands, it changes temperature. If we want air to expand, we either have to make it hot or change the pressure. But first, we need a crazy story. In the past, I usually tell a story that's on our website at rocketscience.com. But some people may have already seen it, so I'm going to mess up the story, change it completely. Uh, it's all improvised. So we never know how these things are going to end. If you're listening, at some point you may want to give a suggestion on how you'd like to see the story end. Let's suppose that our story takes place on a planet that has no air. And the folks that are living there have built a big glass dome. And inside the dome, they put all the air that they need to breathe. And let's suppose they dug a big pit under it. And there's some caves in the pit. Like this. People could live in those caves if they want. And let's suppose also that they decided to create more space. So they built some big disks and they can stack these disks on top of each other. And each disk may be 10 miles across. There's enough space there to put hundreds and hundreds of houses. And we'll pop it off with one more. Okay, so now we have this enormous disk up there. And let's suppose that living on the top, we have a giant. And he's in charge of everything. And he's not a very happy giant. He likes to eat things, like people, for instance. And let's suppose that he's found a buddy. Somebody that thinks like he does, his name is Evil Mr. Fred. And Evil Mr. Fred gets to live one level down. And he has a castle tower that he lives in. And his castle tower has a mustache, just like Evil Mr. Fred's. And it's Evil Mr. Fred, he wears a cowboy hat and has a mustache too. And Evil Mr. Fred does whatever the giant tells him to because He's a giant. And even Mr. Fred likes to make everybody else's life miserable. And even Mr. Fred has a bunch of helpers called minions. Minions are little guys like this with big feet and mustaches. And they do whatever evil Mr. Fred says, but they don't think too much on their own. 
Down in the middle, we have regular folks living in their houses, trying to get along, raising their families. So there's houses and houses all over in here. Then there's another level of poorer people down below. They don't have such big houses. They live in cardboard boxes. Down here. They're poor people. And then down at the very bottom, living in the caves, are the poorest people of all. And they have to do what everybody tells them. And down here we have living Jack. He's got straight hair. And Jill. She's got long curly hair. Her hair is infinitely long. In fact, they had to build a special door through the dome so her hair could get out. Like that. And everybody that lives on this thing gets all of their water and their electricity from the people down below. Everybody down below has to do what they're told. All the water goes up through this pipe, and the giant gets to use it first. When he's done washing his dishes and doing whatever he does with the water, he pours it down onto the next layer. And they have to take this used water and use it for whatever they want. Of course, when they're done, they pour it out onto the next layer. And the water gets dirtier and dirtier as it goes, until finally it comes to the bottom, where Jack and Jill and all their buddies get to use it. Now, Jack and Jill don't have too many friends down there. Most of the people just hide a lot. But there is one special friend of theirs, Humpty Dumpty, a big egg. Humpty Dumpty is supposed to have special powers, but Humpty has grown too big. Humpty lives in a milk bottle, and he would like to get back into his milk bottle, but he doesn't fit. And he always tells people that if he was able to get back into his milk bottle, he'd have magical powers like a genie, and he could do anything that they ask. But nobody has ever been able to get Humpty back into the bottle so that he could do that. Well, Jack and Jill, they don't like being down there. They don't like the other people being slaves to whoever, whoever is up above. And they're always trying to think of some way to escape. But evil Mr. Fred says, nope, nobody ever escapes. Not until my castle completely collapses will anybody ever escape. And Jack and Jill think about this, and they think about this, and say, hmm, how could we collapse evil Mr. Fred's castle? And they did find out that when the giant is hungry and he wants some soup, he grabs evil Mr. Fred's castle, pours some cold soup in it, and cooks the entire castle over the fire until the soup is boiling, and then he drinks it right out of the castle. And uh, Jack and Jill said, hmm, that's kind of a good thing. At least he's got the castle in his hand. And the giant likes to play games sometimes. He'll create fake clouds on the ceiling. And then every once in a while, he'll push a button, and a huge downpour will come. Water will come pouring out of this. All the water that Jack and Jill have to help pump up to the top. He just kind of has fun with it and makes this rain. Now, if you were Jack and Jill, how would you escape from this place? How would you get evil Mr. Fred's castle to collapse? And how would you get Humpty into the bottle? Can you think of any ways to do this? Now, if you have some ideas, you can type them in on the chat room. And we'll do a few experiments. We're going to leave this story to the continued dot 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 while we do some of the experiments. And maybe after you see the experiments, you'll have some ideas on how to do this stuff yourself. Let's see. Over here we have a stove. We'll crank it up a little bit. We have a pot. The pot's got some water in it. Here's Roland's hat, got the little knob. Turn the stove up full blast. Now you might be able to see there's a tiny bit of steam coming out of the pot. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see how long it takes to whistle. 
really hot under there. It's starting to gurgle. No, it's just a little. The steam is almost invisible. It's only when it needs cool air that we can see it is kind of like fog. Now, we're going to take this pot, it's reasonably hot, yeah, not going good. and I'm going to point it at that aluminum ball and see if we can see the steam better on the ball. Is there, and that's out of here. Now, you remember earlier I told you that flame makes steam. It's kind of hard to believe. Looks like a flame to me. Doesn't look like there'd be any steam in there. We'll turn up all the way in. We get a cooler spot again. I'm going to point the flame at the ball. If there's any steam in there, we should see it on the ball. I hope that shows up on your video, because it's making lots of steam. Let me draw a face. Point, point, and nose. So, flames make steam. So we want to do something with some steam. Well, uh, for our first experiment, we'll put some water in an ordinary soda can. If you're doing this at home, you can hold the soda can with some tongs and take them onto the can, but we have this handy dandy hose clamp handle thing that works really good. So we'll put some water in the can. Since this is a live show, who knows what's going to happen. And we'll fire up our torch again. I'll heat up the can. And you don't really need a propane torch to do this at home. It just is quite a bit faster for the propane torch. You can just heat it up over a stove like we did with that pot. Once it gets hot, the water is going to change in steam. The steam is going to start coming out the top. And it's going to push out all the other parts of the air. Air's got nitrogen in it, it's got oxygen in it, tiny, tiny bit of carbon dioxide. It's going to push it all out of there so the can will be full of just steam. I think I'll bring it over here. Our cameraman today is Matt. If I keep moving around, it gives him something to do. Can you see that? Uh, they might be able to hear it if I get close enough. Hang on. Now you can see, hopefully, there's steam coming out of there. And it's coming up about a foot. And it's boiling really good. Oops, my flame went out. We're going to turn it upside down and put it in the water. All that steam it's going to want to change back into water. When it does, it's going to get a thousand times smaller than before. Yeah, that's doing good. You count of five. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, look at the can. It got crushed. Hmm. 
If you have any ideas about why that can got crushed, you might type them into the chat room. So there's something going on there that looks like magic. And the can got completely squished. Okay. Yeah. I'm try one more can. What if we did it too slow? What if we put some water in our can, boiled it really good, and then just slowly put it in? Would it still crush? I like propane torches. The flame is over 1,900 degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't usually take too long to heat things up. The hottest part of the flame is up here. Okay, on the count of five, we're going to do it slowly this time. One, two, three, four, five. Now, if you have any ideas <laughs> why that one went faster than before, you could type that in. And later, if we get a chance, we'll talk about these. This is the one that went very quick. This is the one that went slow. The slow one smushed faster than the quick one. So, let's see. Here we are. Okay, no questions yet. So we can continue on. Now, you remember Jack and Jill have down below their friend Humpty Dumpty? He can't get back into his jar. Wow. How are you going to do that? We have a, uh, a suitable jar here somewhere. Oh, here he is. We have a different, couple of different kinds of Humpties. One Humpty is a water banana. And we have a, a jar, and our water balloon doesn't like to go into that jar. And we have an egg. Oh, this is a perfect egg. Luckily, we have a lady here that knows how to take the shells off our eggs and leave them smooth. What was your name? Olga. Olga did the egg for us. And the egg kind of sits on the jar. If we hit it, it would smash the egg. And we want the egg to go inside. And let's suppose that our egg we should have some personality, I suppose. Here. Here an egg. And we want it to go inside. Uh, if, if you had to do that, how would you get the egg in the jar without smushing the egg too badly? And we'll give you some stuff to try. You could try a piece of paper towel. You could try some wax paper. Let's try a paper towel first, just for fun. We want a piece of paper towel that we can just drop into the jar. Of course, to make it good, it should be on fire. If you're doing it this at home, this at home, make sure you have a glass of water nearby. In case your hair catches on fire, you can pour it over your head. Okay, here goes our paper and our egg. Look at it, he's vibrating. <laughs> and the egg is in the jar. 
Not too hard to do. You can try that at home. This, this is called a conical flask. It has a nice round edge. Like in the old days, they had milk bottles with nice rounded edges. At the grocery store, you can find fruit drink bottles. They're, they're not too bad. They're about the same size. But let's do it again with an egg that has a few craters in it. This is how I peel eggs, too. It's got a few little holes. Will it still work? Take a piece of paper towel. And it's got to be small enough to fit in the hole. That's good. Light it on the fire. Get your egg all ready to go. Maybe you can see it on the video. There's holes. Point the egg on there. It vibrates. Are you going to go egg? Oh, it's getting ripped apart. Poor egg. <laughs> <laughs> and the poor egg got part of his skin taken off, but he still went back down into the hole. And you know, somehow that, that burning piece of paper sucked the egg down inside. If you have some ideas why it did that, you might type those in now too. Now suppose we don't have any eggs, but we have a water balloon. And we want a water balloon to go in the jar. Would a water balloon work? Down there. It's quite a bit bigger than the egg. It's going to take a lot of doing to get that inside. And what if the water balloon catches on fire? That would be good. I'll put some paper in there. So fold it a little bit. I notice if you wrap the paper too tightly, it doesn't burn that well inside the jar. Okay. Bounce like the egg does as much. He vibrates a little bit. Oh, there he goes. Oh. <laughs> he gets pulled part way down. See there? He's stuck. And you can tell why. When a water balloon tries to go in, there's wrinkles in the balloon. And whatever was forcing him in escapes. Okay. So now you know a few things about getting eggs into jars. What if you had to get it back out again? You now, with, with any luck, you could cool off the jar a little bit if the egg isn't all broken. And slide into the opening. Let's see if you can get the old piece of paper out. Now, how would you get the egg back out of there? There he sits inside the jar. He wants to come out again. We have a way to do this. And we'll show you that a little bit later as well. I'm going to leave our eggs sitting right there. I'm going to take these guys there. Now, for our third experiment, we need a tub. And you can use any tub that you have at home. We'll put some water in it. And at home you might have some clay. You could stick some clay in the water. And you could put a candle on the clay. And then let's move our egg. We could light the candle and put a jar over. We'll try it first without it being lit. When I put the jar on the clay, it bubbles a little bit, and the jar sits down, and there's a candle inside. Now, some books say that when you light the candle and put the jar over it, the candle keeps burning, 
until it uses up the oxygen that's inside the jar, and then it goes out. Then the water comes upwards to take up the place that used to be occupied by the oxygen. Now we want to see if this is true or not. The air around us is about one-fifth oxygen. So about one-fifth up the jar, maybe about there. Well, what we'd like to do is try a jar with one candle on inside, try another jar with two candles inside, and another jar with four candles inside, and another jar with eight candles inside, and then the last jar with 75 candles inside, and see what happens. So I have candles set up on pieces of foam so they can float around good. And we'll just try the one candle jar first. I don't like this. These are just birthday candles. You can get them at almost any grocery store. You want it to burn long enough so that you see an orange tip on the end of the wick. And you take your jar and set it over that. And see what it does. And it slowly goes out. And the water level in the jar is just a little bit higher than the water level in the pan. We're going to leave that one right there. We're going to take another float with two candles. Think the water is going to go the same level that it did with the one candle, or higher, or lower. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it went up. The first jar went up to right there. The second one went up to right there. Now we'll double that number of candles. Got four of them. to see a pattern. Here's eight candles. jar is more than one-fifth full. It's up to there. It's almost half. Let's scoop these over a little bit make a little more room. So, adding more candles <laughs> makes the water go up higher. Now for the fun one. 75 candles. Stick that one right there. Okay. If you have a smoke alarm, it'll probably go off. There we go. Get 
your birthday. Happy birthday to you. That jar is sucked down to the pan so tight. It's creeping upwards. There we go. Let's see what we got here. There. So, now we can see the more candles you get, the higher it goes. Hmm. Why does it do that? Well, it has a lot to do with hot air. The more candles you get, the more hot air is available. As you're putting the jar over the top, that hot air is trapped inside. When the hot air cools, it shrinks and it pulls in some water. But you remember, whenever you burn something, not only is there hot air there, there's a little bit of carbon dioxide and a little bit of water vapor. And you remember when the water vapor comes back into water, it shrinks. It can crush a can. The water vapor shrinks, the hot air cools, and whoop, up comes the water from the lake into the jar. The hot air effect is probably the biggest one because as we move upwards, we're getting more and more hot air trapped in there. The water vapor effect is probably secondary. So anytime you want to make water get drawn up into something, hot air is a good way to do it. And this might give you an idea also about how our egg got sucked into the jar. A burning piece of paper created hot air. Remember when the egg was sitting there, it was dancing. Blah, 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 blah. That was some of the hot air escaping. And then when the air started to cool off, it started to shrink again and suck the egg back down again. And in this case, of course, the steam created inside. As soon as we tipped it over and put it in the water, the steam turned back into water, became a thousand times smaller and made the can collapse. I have no idea why doing it slow works better than doing it fast. It's just one of those weird things. If you figure that out, uh, you can be a scientist, write a paper about it, and become rich and famous. Now, we need to create an ending for our story. We have the giant up there. We've got evil Mr. Fred up there. He's in his castle. All the poor people are down below being mistreated. And they aren't ever going to escape unless they can figure out some way to collapse evil Mr. Fred's castle. Or maybe they can figure out some way to get Humpty into his job. Well, you already know the answer to some of this stuff. Let's suppose Jack and Jill try Humpty first. They get a great burning bush and throw it into the jar and say, Humpty, all you have to do is jump on top of the jar above the burning bush and you'll get sucked right inside. And Humpty says, what? I don't want to get cooked. I just want to get inside the jar. And Jack and Jill said, come on, just try it. It'll be okay. So they pour water all over Humpty and put him on top of the jar right over the burning bush. And sure enough, Humpty starts dancing all over the place and kabook goes down inside of the jar. And then Humpty changes. Instead of being an egg, he changes into a genie. He comes out of the jar. And he says, my wish is your command. He's wearing a turban. And Jack and Jill said, wow, that's great. We can wish anything and you'll give it to us? And the genie says, yep, you saved me. I'll let you do anything you want. And Jack and Jill said, well, let's suppose the giant is really hungry for some soup and he wants to cook it in evil Mr. Fred's castle. Let's have, let him have some soup in evil Mr. Fred's castle. And the genie says, your wish is my command. Next thing you know, the giant grabs evil Mr. Fred's castle, shakes off evil Mr. Fred, turns it upside down, pours in some soup, and starts cooking it over a fire until the soup is really boiling. And then, Jack and Jill said, oh, one more wish. 
Just when the soup is really boiling, let it be a downpour from the giant's cloud. And sure enough, after the soup was boiling really good and there was steam gushing out of it, boom, huge cloudburst. The castle cooled off instantly and collapsed. Kunk! Just like the soda can. And Jack and Jill said, Yes, we did it. We collapsed the evil Mr. Fred's castle. Now, poor evil Mr. Fred, when he got shook off the castle, went boing, 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 crash down to the very bottom level. He hates it down there. And Jack and Jill said, For our last wish, we wish that we were back home again. And evil Mr. Fred had to stay here in the bottom and do whatever the giant makes him do. And the genie said, Your last wish is my command. And they all lived happily ever after, except evil Mr. Fred. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Hope you had a good time. Thank you, Mr. Mac. This was awesome. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Fantastic. Great. Then, um, now let's move on to the next um, topic. Next topic is something from Joan Avila. Joan Avila created a 3D model of the Science Castle that we have today here in the rocket science facilities. So Matt, if you could move the camera over there to the screen, you can take a look. Um, I hope you see that online. But this is the 3D model of the Science Castle that you can move around. So you can see, you can take a view from the top Move it around, completely spin it, and you get the first time ever a view of the Science Castle in 3D. Isn't that awesome? Jones spent, oh, somehow I got inside of the castle. You see that? Jones spent several weeks creating this castle. Now I'm inside of the Science Castle. Walking around here, you can see there's several doors, things. I need, let me zoom out here. This is simply, simply fantastic. It's done with um, a software called SketchUp from Google. And you have next to the screen, you have a link that says Google SketchUp where you can download the software. You can also simply go to Jones profile, simply click on Jones name and it takes you to the profile. You can do that either right now or um, after, after the show, but on his page, you can get a link to where you can download the 3D version of the Science Castle. So thank you, Joan, for preparing that, and I uh, hope that everybody is going to take a look and um, enjoy it. Okay, and now the last part, the last part of our anniversary celebration is our awards ceremony. This is something we do like four times per year where we are rewarding the top contributing students at the castle. And we selected a number of different categories that we are rewarding. And as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the event, we got a couple of great prizes from Arbor Scientific, Lanier, and the Tickle Me Plant Company that we are now going to give away to the top contributing students. Let me um, grab the list here, and I will read. I will read the category. Um, Mr. Mack will talk about the price that this category will get, and then I will announce the winner. Okay. So, the first category that we are rewarding is the top contributing students. That's the students that got the most science points in the science castle and you can get science points for all kinds of things like submitting experiments, books and so forth. So the first top contributing student is John Avila and he gets a number of prizes. Um, one is he gets a room which he has already because he won last time and then he gets this here. Here we have a uh, temperature probe that you can hook onto your computer about the handiest thing there is because all you have to do is plug it into your USB port and you'll get a readout. 
So, you know, if you're sitting at home and you have a milkshake, you can stick this in your milkshake and see what temperature it is. You can stick it in your dad's hot coffee and see what that is. Now you can take it outside and see that it's 120 out there and run back inside. Uh, it's a really cool thing to have. It looks pretty much indestructible, so it doesn't break like all the glass things. Yeah, and it comes, um, it comes with software, so you can actually load the results onto your PC and compare them. Okay, the second top contributing student is JWS Packer fan, and he gets um, this ball here. <laughs> Looks like a ping pong ball, and it's not a ping pong ball. It's called a UFO ball. It has a couple of metal tabs on it, which is pretty handy on the bottom, but you don't have to let your friends see that. If you hold it in your hand, you can try it on different parts of your skin and see what it does. And some people can make different tones out of it. My hands today are making just a high pitch, but you can make lower pitches. And you can control it. And if you're careful, you can make it so other people can't. If their skin is real dry, they won't be able to turn it on. That's called the UFO ball. Graves. And then the third um, most contributing student is Einstein. Albert Einstein, and he gets Okay, a ceramic mug has Science Castle logo on one side and a Rocket Science Castle lo Rocket Science logo on the other side. Great, so thank you, Einstein, JWS Packer fan, and Joan Avila for your top contributions to the Science Castle. The next prize or category is the highest rated science experiment. And the highest rated science experiment in the entire year is the Amazing Magic Milk Experiment contributed again by Joan Avila. The experiment got 32 ratings and an average rating of 4.5 and he gets for this experiment these pair these are vibrating magnetic things. You're supposed to throw them in the air and let them hit together, They're, and they vibrate in the air. With a little practice, you can make them kind of sing in the air as they go. <laughs> and even when they hit concrete, they don't break. We've had them around here for a long time, uh, some like these, and they, they really last a long time. They're pretty amazing. And you got to figure out, you know, why, if they're magnets, how can you come you can put it this way and it's stable? And what? That way it's stable, but it doesn't like to be any other position. So those are a real cool thing to have. So thanks again, Joan, for the highest rated science experiment. And thanks uh, to Arbor Scientific for the great um, award. The next category is for the student contributed the most science experiment to the castle. And again, that is Joan. Um, he contributed a total of 47 experiments <laughs> to the Science Castle, and he will get um, this here. Okay, tickle me plant. And what was this, a mimosa? I yes, believe so. a mimosa. Yeah, with a little patience you grow the plant, and then after it's grown, if you touch it, it moves, which is kind of unusual for a plant. And then it comes back to its regular shape. If you don't hit it with a baseball bat or anything. Uh, it can survive a long time. Yeah. So thanks, Joan. Plus, this comes also with this t-shirt. You have the Science Castle logo and the Rocket Science logo on the front. And on the back, you have Science Castle first year anniversary. Thank you, Joan. And um, three more categories. The student finished the most science experiments. It's again Joan. This is, the last, this is the last category for Joan. The other two categories are actually um, won by, by two other students. So for the student who the most uh, finished the most science experiments, we have um, a coat of arms mug. So another one of these that we just talked about. So you actually might have 
two of those marks now drawn. And then we're moving on to the highest rated book recommendation. And the winner of that category is the Prism and the Pedulum, the 10 most beautiful experiments in science. And that was contributed by Maya. And Maya will get a sciencecastle.com anniversary mark. So, same thing like this one here. And now the last one. The last one is for the highest rated article. And that has been contributed by JWS Packerfan. JWS Packerfan created an article about Niels Bohr. And um, the article got 12 ratings with an average rating of 3.8 and is the winner for this year. And uh, JWS Packerfan will get these pair of cells. Now these things are pretty interesting. They were first discovered, this shape was first discovered in Egypt. The guys exploring around the Great Pyramid found some of these and didn't know what they were. They were playing with them sitting around the campfire. And one guy was just sitting there, and he spun it. And it did that. He said, well, now that's bizarre. Why did it turn around and go backwards? So he spun it again, and it went backwards. He said, hmm, then somebody else took it, and they spun it themselves. But they spun it that way. And it didn't turn around and go backwards. So they spun it again. And it just went one way. And they thought, wow, this is bizarre. How did those guys know how to do this? And then one of them took it and went boing. He just rock it. Boing. And around it goes. So somehow the Egyptians invented this very odd shape that seems to have a mind of its own. So this will be our prize. Or, which was that again? The JWS Hackerfern for the yeah. best article provided to the Science Castle. Yeah. Okay, I think with that we are at the end yeah. of our event. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Mack Thanks for performing the experiments. Yeah. It was uh, great. I'd also like to thank again Arbor Scientific, Vernier, and the Tickle Me Plant Company for providing their prices. I'd also like to thank the Bay Area Parents Magazine for putting us into their calendar. And of course I'd like to thank all the students uh, for contributing great content to the Science Castle and everyone here for making this event happen. I do want to apologize for the bad quality of the video. Uh, the video will be posted um, at the end of the session. And I hope um, next time when we do an event like that, we will make sure that the quality of the video will be better. So thanks everybody, and we'll hope to see you again when it's again, it's almost magic time. Thanks, and bye-bye.